حبيب الله رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he only humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he born in humans to be the best and give his best religion to Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبيه ومصطفى سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وبعد Brothers and sisters welcome to another new episode of your program Gardens of the Pious May Allah make us all from amongst أهل الجنة the people and the dwellers of paradise Amen Today's episode is number 180 and uh, we'll continue explaining chapter number 44, which deals with honoring the scholars, the elders, and uh, giving them the proper respect and raising their status. Today, inshallah, we'll begin with hadith number 352. The hadith is narrated by Jabir ibn Abdullah. May Allah be pleased with him and his father. أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يجمع بين الرجلين من قتل أحد يعني في القبر ثم يقول أيهما أخذ للقرآن فإذا أشير إلى أحدهما قدمه في اللحت رواه البخاري so in this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after the battle of Uhud was over, started burying the martyrs, arranging the burial of two of the martyrs in one grave. In each case, he would ask, Ayuhuma akhdal lil Qur'an? Which one of them had learned more Quran by heart. Which one of them have memorized more Quran? And whichever was thus pointed out to him was placed by him first in the lahd, in the grave. This is an observation of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, to the Prophet and how he dealt with people according to their knowledge and their understanding. Remember, the ayah which was used as a reference in the beginning of the chapter is قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوُ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ إِنَّمَا يَتَذَكَّرُ قُلُوا الْأَلْبَابِ And we said this is a negative question and its answer is definitely not. They shouldn't be treated the same. The knowledgeable one and those who have no knowledge. After Mass and after the Battle of Uhud, there was a big chaos. After the Muslims achieved victory first, and their enemies, the Meccans, under the leadership of Abu Sufyan, fled from the battlefield, leaving behind all their war spoils and their valuables. So Muslims started collecting the war spoils and celebrating the victory. But when the 50 archers who were led by Abdullah ibn Jubayr, disputed, and 40 of them decided to descend from the mount of the archers to join the Muslims in collecting the war spoils. Khalid ibn Walid uh, saw this opportunity, and he managed to turn around, and he occupied this mount of the archers, and he started attacking after killing the remaining 10 companions uh, on the mount of the archers, uh, started attacking the Muslims and shooting them in their backs. And there was a big chaos. Most Muslims, most of the Muslim army ran off and left the battlefield. And the Prophet ﷺ was left alone with a few of his companions. As a result of that, there was a big casualty amongst Muslims. Al-Hamza, the Prophet's uncle, was martyred. 
Mus'ab ibn Umayyah, the first ambassador in Islam was martyred. Anas ibn Nadr and many others, 70 of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ were martyred. And Muslims were worn out. When the Meccans left from the battlefield, after they left and they covered a few miles, they disputed amongst themselves that you didn't really do nothing because Muhammad is still alive. Abu Bakr is still alive, Umar is still alive, you haven't achieved anything. He didn't claim any land, he didn't claim any prisoners of war, he just killed some of them. So there was a suggestion of going back and trying to eliminate the remaining of Muslims, perhaps kill the Prophet, and uh, particularly those companions who were like his uh, ministers, Abu Bakr, or Umar, or Uthman, and Ali, may Allah be pleased with all of them. So as a result of that, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam summoned those who are very near to him of his companions and chased the Meccans. And they camped at a place which is known as Hamra al-Asad, a few miles away from al Medina, And they camped there for some time in order to challenge the Meccans who were ready to fight, even though they were worn out. The Prophet Sallallahu teeth were broken, his face was injured as blood came out of his face. And, um, you know, it, it was a big chaos. When this all was over, the Prophet Sallallahu returned to bury the dead. And they were so tired and worn out. So the Prophet Sallallahu ordered digging the graves. Not 70, but rather he would bury each two in one grave. Because, as I said, they were so exhausted so when they did so, and the number, the casualty was big, 70, the Prophet ﷺ would have two at a time to be buried. He would ask, أَيُّهُمَا أَكْثَرُ أَخْذًا لِلْقُرْآنِ Allah. Even at the time of death, even during the funeral and the burial, the person who has more Qur'an, memorized more Qur'an, is given superiority. So they are all companions of the Prophet ﷺ, have all performed hijrah, have all been martyred on the battlefield, and they were, along with the Prophet ﷺ, were an honor. So the factor which determined who is superior to the others, if this companion had memorized more Qur'an, they dig the lahd on the side of the grave to bury each one. So the Prophet ﷺ would ask, who knows more Qur'an by heart? He said, this person. Okay, bring him first. فَيُقَدِّمُهُ He will bury him first. So the preference was given even between each two to the one who have learned more Qur'an. That shows us the importance of seeking knowledge, the importance of learning Qur'an, and the superiority of those who know more Qur'an. Not like us nowadays. If you travel across the Muslim world, it's very shocking, it's very sad. Wealthy people put their kids in international schools so that they learn English, French, and perhaps a third language to excel in math, in science, which is all great. But the child doesn't know how to read in the Mus'haf. And only poor people send their kids to the madrasa so that it's a common understanding that if somebody is poor, if somebody is handicapped, if somebody has a child who is disabled or blind, put him in madrasa. We have to remove and eliminate this false understanding. No. Memorizing the Quran and learning the Quran is the greatest quality, especially if the person comprehended what he learned and if the person practiced what he learned. But the first step is to learn and memorize. So the Prophet ﷺ paid a special respect to the companion who learned more Qur'an. As I said, they're all shuhada. They're all companions of the Prophet ﷺ. But in the sound hadith, you would say, أَيُّهُمَا أَكْثَرُ أَخْذًا لِلْقُرْآنِ Who have 
memorize more Quran, said the Sahabi, bring him first, bring him down first. So we have to understand that when you spare some time for your child to learn Quran, especially at the golden age from five till 12, because after that, especially when the kids grow older, become teenagers and they go to high school, there are a lot of obstacles. It doesn't mean that it's over, no. But this is the best time for them to memorize, for them to learn. Some people, they consider insignificant memorizing Quran and say, yeah, what is more important is practice and behavior. We say, of course, we agree. But also memorization is important. Do not belittle that because you don't want it. Do not belittle that because you cannot afford it. When we were studying in the medical school, the best students were those in medicine, in pharmacology, those who have memorized the Quran. There is no conflict of interest. You can achieve both. Why do you think that if you wanna be a successful doctor, then you don't have time for the deen. You don't have time to memorize Quran, says who? By experience, we prove this is not true. Al-Quran gives you barakah. Barakah means blessings, blessings in your time, blessings in your understanding. So what others need, like a few hours to study this class or the subject, you can achieve it and have this time or acquire of this time. When you begin your study by reciting your sabaq or reading your sabaq, Allah will give you barakah in your time. The house in which Quran is recited expands. You mean expands physically? Well, physically is not everything because I have met this lady and she said, she'll pray for us ever since we moved to this villa, nice palace, it's like hell. Wallahi, she says, it's like hell. We're living in hell. I said, what if I ask you that there is a flat of one bedroom, only one bedroom, but you'll experience happiness in it and whatever is worrying you will depart you. She said, please. I said, why don't you move and leave this house? Because I knew that this house her husband had bought from Haram. That's why there is no barakah in it. When the barakah, the blessings is withdrawn, it doesn't matter how much you have. You are never happy. You're always complaining. You feel you don't have enough. When you have barakah and the barakah and the blessings, the sins, and it comes along with the Quran, when you have a child at home who have memorized the Quran and he recites it on a regular basis, there is no room for shayateen. There is no, no room for nightmares. There is no room for envy and sorcery and magical spells and all of that because the Quran is there. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Alaykum uh, bizzahrawain. Adhere and stick to the recitation of the two beautiful bright surahs, Al-Baqarah wa Ali Imran, فَإِنَّ أَخْذَهُمَا بَرَكَةً وَتَرْكَهُمَا حَصْرَةً For those who recite these two surahs, memorize them, understand them, and recite them on a regular basis, baraka, it brings baraka at home. A house in which surah Al-Baqarah is recited, no Satan will enter it for three days, for three days. I know that people pay a lot of money, some people even hire people and they fly them first class so that they can recite Quran in their house and give them ruqya because the girl is not happy, the boy is not studying or they feel that there is an evil eye. We all know all of that. We deal with those people. You don't have to do any of that. Just recite the Quran on your own. Spend some time with your kids, bring a private tutor. When the father is paying a hundred bucks for a piano class, then when a Quranic teacher and a private uh, Quranic teacher is there to teach, they negotiate with them, they wanna pay a hundred bucks for the whole month. On the other hand, I ask the Quranic teachers not to exaggerate in a charging because what Allah is giving you, uh, no one can match, no one can match. It's okay to make your living and to live a reasonable life but Quran is not about business. Whatever you're charging is not for teaching the Quran. This is what the scholars said, Imam Hanifa said, this is not a compensation for teaching the Quran because no one can compensate you for that but Allah. 
but this is known as ajrul hafs because in order to spare four hours a day for four or five families to teach their kids the Quran, I'm not going to go to work. So this is simply instead of going to work, when I going to pay you whatever you're getting paid if you were to go to work, but not for teaching the Quran. And the parents and the family should be very generous with the teachers of the Quran. Why we see them always in a very humble condition, enriching them if you have a chance, if you have access to do that. Al-Quran, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know when your child memorizes the Quran, on the day of judgment, Allah will call upon you, you and your missus, and will place the crown of the honor on your heads. Why? Because your child has memorized the Quran. What about if you were involved in this process too? MashaAllah. I know a few American brothers and sisters, native Americans. Their parents are still non-Muslims. They converted when they grew up and they started from the scratch. They started by learning the alphabet and they memorized Quran and they memorized the whole book. And uh, not only that, they mastered the art of the recitation of the Quran. I know a few brothers and a few sisters. Sister Karima Sabneski, MashaAllah memorized the whole Quran and she has an ijazah with the 10 different dialects. If she can make it, then we can make it. Whether you are an engineer or an accountant or a teacher or whatever, we have to spare time for the Quran. That what gives us superiority, what makes us better before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you're better before Allah, this is what matters most. That what matters most. So even at death and at the burial, the Quran gave preference to those who knew more Quran among the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The following hadith, hadith number 353, is narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhuma. Anna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal, arani fi al-manami atasawwaku bisiwak fajaani rajulan أحدهما أكبر من الآخر فناولت السواك الأصغر فقيل لي كبر فدفعته إلى الأكبر منهما رواه مسلم um, In this hadith, Abdullah ibn Umar رضي الله عنهما narrated that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said It was shown to me in my dream, in my night vision that I was cleaning my teeth with a miswak, and two men came to me, one being older than the other, and gave the miswak to the younger one. I gave the miswak to the younger one, but I was asked to give it to the older, which I did. Even in a night vision, well obviously the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to honor the elders, and used to respect them. And we spoke before uh, about how the Prophet ﷺ used to honor his guests and used to honor the elders, and he taught us that. Um, and we mentioned a few incidents in this regard, and there is plenty that we have not discussed yet, such as in the case of Jarir ibn Abdullah al-Bajali, and how when he came to one house and the Prophet ﷺ was sitting, but there was no room, the house was full. So the Prophet ﷺ notes that Jarir was standing by the door outside. He took of his own rida, and he wrapped it, then he threw it to him and he said, sit on it. So Jarir kissed it, and he sent it back to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Akramak Allahu ya Rasulallah kama akramtani. May Allah honor you as you honored me. That was an honor. That was an honor. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There are many, many lessons we learn from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with regards to honoring and respecting those who should be honored and respected. And this whole chapter is about that. Once Abdullah ibn Abbas, and he was a young boy, a teenager, sitting in a halqa in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sitting. And he received 
a gift, a bowl of milk. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us to share. He never began by himself. A bowl of milk is coming to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, enough for him to drink. But instead, he would pass it on on everyone, then he would be the last to drink. And the Sunnah is to begin from right to left. So when he wanted to begin from the right side of his, he realized that there was this teenager, about 13, 12, 13 years old, Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and his father. So he said, Ya Ghulam, very amazing. He said, oh young man, would you permit me to begin with the elders? I'm gonna skip you because, you know, we have elders. But there is here a conflict of interest, which is beginning with the elders, is a sunnah. And also beginning from right to left is a sunnah. But from right to left is given superiority. But the person who's sitting to the right is a young boy, Abdullah ibn Abbas. He treated him as if he was an adult and he sought permission from him. He's teaching us, he's teaching his companion, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's teaching his companions the great ethic and ethics. So he said, مَا كُنْتُ لِأُوثِرَ بِسُؤْرِكَ أَحَدًا عَلَيْهِ No way. I was never going to give uh, any person a superiority over me with regards to drinking after you. Because in this case, the Prophet ﷺ took a sip, then he wanted to pass it on to his companions. So he said, no, no, no way. I should be the first to drink after you and to place my lips where you have been drinking. So the Prophet ﷺ gave it to him. And uh, he taught us also in this hadith a very beautiful etiquette and adab. So Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhuma said, the Prophet ﷺ said, when I was asleep, I saw a dream, a night vision. Um, and I saw myself brushing my teeth with a miswak. And the miswak is a great tradition and sunnah that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the sound a hadith لَوْلَا أَنْ أَشُقَّ عَلَىٰ أُمَّتِي لَا أَمَرْتُهُمْ بِالسُّوَاكِ مَعَ كُلِّ صَلَاةِ أَوْ قَبْلَ كُلِّ صَلَاةِ If I'm not afraid that it would be too much or I would burden my ummah, I would have commanded them to brush their teeth with every salah, before every salah, with every wudu. The Prophet وسلم, even when he was lying down on his deathbed, he saw somebody is holding the miswak, so Aisha understood what he meant. She grabbed hold of the miswak and she softened it and she gave it to the Prophet Miswak, Matharatul lil fami, mardatul lil rabbi. Matharatul lil is for your personal hygiene, to clean up your teeth and your mouth. Mardatul lil rabbi, we all brush our teeth or most will brush our teeth. But most of us, most people, they brush their teeth because they don't want to uh, have problems with their teeth. They don't want to have any erosion. They want their teeth to look good, to look white. But in our case, both we purify ourselves outside and internally brush our teeth and we do that to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna Allah jameelun yuhibbu al-jamal. Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty and He loves cleanness and He loves purity. Inna Allah yuhibbu al-tawabeen wa yuhibbu al-mutatahhireen. Verily Allah loves those who frequently repent and those who frequently purify themselves. So even in a dream the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw himself brushing his teeth with the Miswak. Then the Prophet ﷺ saw two men approaching him. One is older than the other. The Prophet ﷺ handed over the miswak to the younger one. فَقِيلَ لِي And it was said to me, كَبِّرْ Give it to the older one. Which I did. Who told him that? An angel or whoever told him that in the dream, most likely an angel. فَدَفَعْتُهُ إِلَى الْأَكْبَرِ مِنْهُمَا So the Prophet ﷺ in this dream, which has turned into 
a form of legislation. الرؤية الصادقة جزء من ستة وأربعين جزءا من النبوة ستة وأربعين جزءا The true night vision represents 46 parts of the prophethood Why is that? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam six months before he received the first revelation in the cave he started experiencing a very unique thing which is he would see the night vision and it would come true exactly as he saw it. Kafalaq subhi, like the daybreak. Very clear. Whatever he would see in a dream, it would come true. So the Prophet ﷺ later said that the true night vision represents one part out of 46 parts of the prophethood. Why? Because the prophethood lasted for 23 years. 23 years times two that is 46. Why times two? Because the Prophet وسلم, experienced that true night vision for six months, half of the year. So 23 years times two, 46. That is the meaning of the true night vision represents one part of 46 parts of the prophethood. So this is a form of legislation, Kabir. This is a prophetic etiquette, which the Prophet وسلم, did. And he mentioned that to his companions, and they have transmitted that to us. So we learn that whenever we have a gathering and we have elders, we should always begin by serving the elders, respecting them and honoring them. Brothers and sisters, let's take a short break and we'll be back, inshallah, in a few minutes. Stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Brothers and sisters, our phone number hasn't been changed. Area code 0020238555249. Alternatively, area code 0020112500 And the email address is gardens at huda.tv. The following hadith is hadith number 354 in the seas of gardens of the pious. The narrator of this hadith is a great companion, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, whom the Prophet وسلم, used to enjoy listening to his recitation. And once the Prophet وسلم, said, you have been given such a melodious voice similar to that which was given to Prophet David, peace be upon him. لَقَدْ أُتِيتَ مِزْمَارًا مِنْ مَزَامِيرِ داود عن أبي موسى رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن من إجلال الله تعالى إكرام ذي الشيبة المسلم وحامل القرآن غير الغالي فيه والجافي عنه وإكرام ذي السلطان المقسط رواه أبو داود والحديث حسن In this hadith our most beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said out of the reverence of Allah is to respect the aged Muslims and the one who has memorized the Quran and does not exaggerate in it and does not neglect it nor forget it and to respect the just rulers Sadaqa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the hadith is a fair hadith and collected by Abu Dawood again some beautiful adab and etiquette in this hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is teaching us when you honor an elder person that's a sign of loving and respecting Allah. That's a sign of revering Allah the Almighty. Because this command is from Allah. As he normally reminds us, if you truly believe in Allah and in the last day, then honor your guest, honor your neighbor, say what is good or be quiet. So when you honor the Shaybatil Muslim, somebody who grew up and aged in Islam, started growing 
gray hair. When you honor him, that's a sign of respecting and revering Allah himself. When we were students, we used to take the bus and the train to go to school, and we would travel for several hours every day. And of course, the population is so huge, so we'd be crumbled in the train for several hours, then we'd crumbled in the bus for another hour and a half or so, back and forth. That was like a daily routine. It was, uh, some people look at it as a torture, but for the sake of Allah and seeking knowledge, it was okay, alhamdulillah. The thing is, every time we get in the train, sometimes you go early so that you can catch a place, catch a seat, because you can be sitting there for three hours, and if you don't have a seat, you'll be standing. And you will not be standing a proper standing, maybe standing only on one foot, because it will be extremely crowded. Okay, so you go early and you make the best effort. You go at Fajr, you sit in the train, and then when the train is ready to take off, an old man would show up. An old woman would show up. Without any hesitation, you will find several people popping up and say, Ummi, Abi, my respected father, my respected mother, please, what happened? Subhanallah, we don't think about the suffering, that three hours you're going to be standing and whatever. You think about one thing. Respecting this person is a sign of revering, loving and respecting Allah. And you think of this person as you think of your own dad or your own mom. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Hayam from Ghana. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Okay. Please try again, Sister Hayam. Then, when I moved to the States, I used to teach uh, youngsters my age and uh, older people. And amongst those whom I used to teach, a priest who accepted Islam, and he started learning Quran, and he was at the age of 70. He was approaching 70 years old, yeah. And I saw that people who know him would, uh, would call him by his name, Ran. That was his name. And he was a PhD holder. So we called him Ron. So one day I said, uh, Uncle Ron, he liked it. He said, why do you say Uncle Ron? I said, you got to choose. If you like me to call you Uncle Ron, Dr. Ron, Mr. Ron, whatever. I cannot just call you by your name, Ron. So I saw tears in his eyes and said, you know, we didn't learn that in that country. People here they do not care the least. They just call people by their names. I say, we can't do that. We cannot do that. This is a lack of Islam. If the person doesn't respect elders, doesn't, them, doesn't give them the proper respect, this is a sign of weak deen, weak Islam. And I'm saying this so that every Muslim understands whether you're living in Mecca, where is the Kaaba, or living in Moscow, or living in Beijing, or living in Washington, D.C., you have to practice your deen and adhere to the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Assalamu Alaikum. Uh, Sister Ham from Ghana is back on the line. Assalamu Alaikum. Yeah. Wa Alaikum Salaam. Yeah, go ahead, Sister. Wa Alaikum Salaam. Please, Sheikh, how are you? Just fine, Alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. May Allah bless you and your family. Okay. Please, I have one question. Yeah? Yeah. Please, uh, Please, uh, um, I'm there with uh, somebody that I'm going to marry in the future. But I'm going to marry in the future. But I was with him in, in my country before I came here with him. But he has gone uh, to see my family in my, in my country. Mm -hmm. We have done everything. We decide I'm here with kid. When I get back to my country before we can get back. Mm -hmm. but sadly, he, he, he got an accident. So he used all the money that we, uh, we are going to uh, get married with it with him. Mm -hmm. with, uh, with everything, his medication and everything. So... 
I'm also uh, I'm also here and I'm working then I have some money that I want to give it to him so that we can make we can make the ar- arrangements of the marriage. Mm-hmm. So I'm asking is it right for for uh, a Muslim to do that? Because I've I've been with him I think five years now. But he doesn't have a job, so we are planning to get married. So before I came here in Saudi Arabia to work, I'm a nurse here. Before I came here to work, we, he, 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 his family go and see my family, so we are deciding to get married. But now he doesn't have any money in his bank account, so he have, he have, it's not enough, but he has some. He's now working. But sister, he, he hey, has recovered from the hospital, so he's now working. I want to ask here, you a couple of questions in order to answer you. Your family is okay with that. Your guardian is okay with him, with this yeah, guy who proposed op- to you. Okay. Yeah, they are, they are okay second. with him. Okay, Everybody secondly, is okay with him. Uh, after marriage, how is he going to support you? Is he going to find a job, or is he going to? Uh, what is he going to do? Right now, I'm here working. I have money. My salary is fine. I'm working in the hospital. I have money, but he doesn't have enough money. I understand so, that. I understand yeah. that. I read you. But after marriage, are you the person who's going to support the family, or is he going to support the family and look for a job? What did he used yeah, to do before? R- right now, he's working. Now he has recovered from the hospital. He's now working. Okay. He's now working. Yes, sister, I am. You can support him financially in order to get married legally, and there is no problem whatsoever in this regard. Yes, when Allah the Almighty says, وَبِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ indicating that the financial responsibility is due upon the man, it doesn't mean that at the time of marriage, if, alhamdulillah, there is chemistry, your guardian is happy with him, and he gives you the consent, and he happened to have an accident, or is he, if he's broke right now, no problem, you can actually support him, and your guardian can support him, and people can support him. When Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, proposed to marry Fatima, he had nothing. The Prophet وسلم, said, do you have anything to give her as a dowry? He said, none. He said, where is al hutamiya the armor that I gave you, I gave you. He said, it's sitting at home. He said, bring it. So it was a dowry that basically the Prophet ﷺ gave it to him before as a gift. No problem. When the Prophet ﷺ married to Khadija radiallahu anha, she was considered, you can say, a multimillionaire. And she supported the Prophet ﷺ financially. And she gave him time to contemplate in the cave. And, uh, and she spent out of her money uh, on him. But the Prophet ﷺ, was working and was capable to work and earn. He, won, he, he earned and worked uh, since he was uh, even uh, very young, since he joined his uncle, uh, Abu Talib. But what we need to find out that whether the person is capable to work and is willing to work, you know, things, accidents happen, like in your case. If I understood you properly uh, or correctly, that he's not working currently because of the accident. But eventually, inshallah, after recovering, he's going to resume working. No problem. You can give him this money. If you want to give it to him as a loan, fine. If you want to give it to him as a grant or as a gift to facilitate your marriage, fine. Remember also, Sister Ham, that the dowry doesn't have minimum nor maximum. So if he buys a simple ring, if he buys you in a gift, that may be considered as a dowry. We pray for your welfare, both of you, and happy, uh, blessed marriage, inshallah. السلام عليكم. رادر عبد الهادي from the KSA. السلام عليكم يا شيخ. Glad to hear from you once again, sir. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. Likewise, أخي. I have a question again regarding nikah or marriage. Me and my family are all convert Muslim since that I am working here in Saudi Arabia. So my question now is my my son who is about to marry. Uh, is it, can you give me a, a glimpse, yeah, I mean, how, how is the Sunnah way of marriage? Because uh, I heard from one, uh, one propagator from the Islamic Center that a father of a groom can, can marry, can do the nikah and the walima, or the, the ceremony for the marriage of their children or his sons. Is it uh, allowed or is it true or... Do we need to go to the qualified imam or whatsoever? And how is the 
the simplest way of uh, wedding ceremony for a Muslim. Tayyib. Inshallah. Abdul Hadi, congratulations and may Allah make it easy for you, for your son and his um, future wife to get married, inshallah Azza wa Jal. Um, the right order is that you go to the bride's family and it seems like you've been communicating, okay? And then there are two things. The verbal agreement, which makes the uh, couple legally married from an Islamic perspective, where they can move in and everything. But nowadays that is not sufficient because in order to verify whether these two who are walking together in the mall or living together are officially married or not. So some countries require the marriage license. Some countries just require to process a marriage contract, written marriage contract. And that there are official um, clerks who process the marriage uh, contract, uh, even for uh, foreigners. Do that in order to be in the safe side. As far as the walima, the walima is an emphatic sunnah and it's a marriage banquet to be offered either on the night of the wedding, consummating the marriage, or before it, or next morning. This is all valid. Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu an narrated that one morning when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was married, apparently to uh, uh, Zainab, he ordered him to invite people for a feast or the marriage banquet. It was the morning uh, of his marriage sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, also, it is perfectly okay for you as a father-in-law, as the father of your child who just, uh, who just got married, inshallah, he will get married, uh, to offer the walima in his state, no problem, he can do that. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Fatima from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you? Fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking, Sister Fatima. Okay, Sheikh, I have uh, some questions on sending Hajj or Umrah. Yeah. My first question, can someone in the state of Umrah use this antique product and this suitcase and uh, bath soap with good smell? I don't know whether can someone use it. Um, I'm sorry, Sister Fatima, I didn't get your first question quite rightly. You said in the I Umrah. I say that um, this uh, type of product that we use for the armpit, when we, it, the armpit sometimes when the weather is very hot, somebody is smelling. So I don't know if you can use this type of armpit product and these toothpaste that are smelling good and the bath soap smelling good also. Can we use it during hot? Okay, I okay, let me let me repeat what I um, what I understood from you. You're talking about okay. My number two, number two question, number two question. Okay. No, number two question. During uh, the journey to perform Hajj or Umrah, can somebody uh, shut in salah if you are to pray at home? And also, can we also pray Nawafil or not? Okay, I think I got your question, your questions. But before I want to um, advise Brother Abdul Hadi as well, inshallah, after the processing of the marriage contract, uh, you need to do what is known as ishar. Al ishar is the publicity. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, A'linu hadha nikah. A'linu hadha nikah announce this marriage. And another narration in the masjid announce it so that people in the masjid know, in the local community know that these people, these couple, are officially uh, married. There is also a narration which says, وَضْرِبُوا عَلَيْهِ a duf, which is beating the drum, which doesn't have the metal uh, parts, uh, the duff, uh, as a sign of uh, joy and happiness, celebrating the uh, wedding, I mean. But that goes along with uh, getting the certificate or the paperwork so that you will be okay with the local law uh, as well. Uh, the sister who uh, inquired about a couple of things in Hajj, inshallah, this year she is planning on performing Hajj. Whenever you are in a state of Ihram, if the deodorant or antiperspirant that you're using is odorless, 
it is okay to use it. Okay, what is not permitted while in a state of ihram to use anything which is a fragrance or perfume or produces a fragrance or scent. Okay, with regards to your outfit, any outfit which is considered as a perfect hijab, loose and opaque and perfectly cover the entire body except for the hands and the face while you are in ihram, that is perfectly fine. Because the ihram of a woman is on a regular everyday clothes. With regards to shortening the prayer, yes, if you're staying in Mecca, less than four days shorten the prayer. But whenever you pray in jama'ah, in congregation, whether in Mecca or anywhere else when you're traveling, you pray with the imam. If he's praying full, obviously you pray full, like the imam exactly. Whenever you're traveling, you're exempt from offering the nawafil, the sunan. But the two sunnah before Fajr, which are emphatic sunnah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to observe whether he was traveling or resident because of their significance. And similarly, the witch prayer. And there is a difference of opinion between the scholars with regards to the rest of the nawafil, especially if you are in a sacred place like in Mecca, where each prayer is a hundred thousand times greater reward than praying anywhere else. So if you pray according to some of the ulama, the nawafil, the sunan before and after, that is permitted and may Allah reward you. Uh, brothers and sisters, it is very unfortunate we ran out of time. I can imagine the, the hour has elapsed, subhanAllah. May Allah give us barakah in time, but hopefully inshallah, we'll resume with explaining hadith number 354, beginning of the next episode inshallah next week. Until then, assalamu alaikum. رحمة الله وبركاته. حبيب الله رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he only humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them so why did they ignore that forgetting all about him in paradise worshiping cows fair and stones selling the best with the cheapest price so why did they ignore that forgetting all Paradise, worshipping cows, fire and stones, selling their best with the cheapest price.